welcoming to this conference, the first academic conference on the Syrian conflict. Even though the war has been going on for more than six years and Australia is involved deeply in it, uh, militarily, um, particularly last year with the, the strike on Syrian soldiers in Deir ez -Zur. Um, of course, academic discussions of war are usually thought of as something that takes place after the event, sifting through the ashes with a cool, dispassionate approach. But really, it's very valuable to have a rational discussion much earlier than that. The problem is there are, there are quite strong forces of opposition. Um, the next two days, we've got that opportunity to have a, a discussion at length, you know, without any uh, haste. Uh, looking at all the evidence over the last six years, there's a huge amount of evidence now in this war. Uh, perhaps there wasn't in 2011, as was the case with the Libyan conflict. Now there's a great deal of, um, of evidence and we're able to have a, a reasonable discussion. But, uh, as some of you may have seen in the last week or so, there's a great deal of uh, media anxiety about people who question the war line. And there is a very strong war line. And unsurprisingly, the Australian government, our government has really adopted pretty much all the features of the US approach to the war on Syria. So there's been attacks on the organisers of this conflict, for example, you may be aware of these sorts of things. Um, really repeating slogans, you know, this is a pro-Assad conference or whatever, or, you know, people are mad, crazy and so on. Loonies, how can you discuss these sorts of things? How do you question, in this case, the latest attack on Syria by President Donald Trump and the pretext for it, which was the chemical weapons incident in, um, in, uh, in Idlib. Now, some, some of our presenters are going to talk about that particular incident and some recent things that might be in your mind, but of course, this sort of conference has the benefit of being able to talk about the big pictures, the perspective on the whole conflict and the forces behind it and so on, rather than just, just the day-to-day -day, uh, forces. I might add, though, there's one analyst who talked about these recent attacks as a witch hunt and said that they were accompanied by, and particularly in the Murdoch media, but really across the board of the state and corporate media in Australia, demands that the University of Sydney censor, discipline, or even sack staff members, or even calling into question the pretext for the illegal attack ordered by US President Donald Trump. I think that's a fair account of a lot of the media reports in recent times. Well, fortunately, Sydney University, although it's an old conservative body, has risked that sort of stuff, hasn't shown any sign of changing, and so we're able to have this type of discussion today. And thanks to those attacks, I think we're going to have a lot more people attending, particularly this evening. So we booked another room. If you are going to come along this evening, we'll be in the room next door, 101. It holds 300 people. This one holds 100 people, which is adequate for us today, but we're going to a bigger room uh, at 6, 6.30 this evening, basically. So this conference called for papers in the traditional way of academic conferences. We put out a call um, more than two months ago um, and asked anyone to say anything reasonable, pre prepare, present, abstract, anything reasonable about the conflict. We made it specifically clear to some people, including intellectuals in this city, that we were prepared to uh, contemplate papers, if they were of decent quality, of those people that supported the Al-Qaeda groups and, and the US forces against Syria too, even though it's a position most of the organisers disagreed with. But no papers came from that perspective at all. It's not to say that the papers that we have uh, in the next two days, over the next two days, there's uh, 19 or 20 papers, are all pro-government, but they're sympathetic to Syria. Most of them are sympathetic to Syria and the Syrian people. Um, so um, the result is we've got a range of issues. Some people specialise in the media, some people specialise on the aspects of political Islam, on the, the involvement of Hezbollah, the, Le the Lebanese resistance forces in the war, the role of the big powers and so on. There's a range of issues you will have seen. And we'll have, we have long sessions. This session, for example, starting at 9.30, we can go to 12, we can even go after 12 if we wanted. Normally there'll be 20 minute presentations. In this case, we've got, we've got three presenters here. We may have, our fourth may be here, but I haven't seen him yet. Um, so that would mean, we, it's a fairly long session and we've got time for uh, a decent extended period of questions after that. A long lunch time, then we come back for an afternoon session. So, uh, some of the things we can look at rather than the, the sort of sloganeering of media coverage of issues like this, uh, I, I think some of our presenters this morning are going to touch on this, for example. Some of the detail 
detailed analysis behind the recent uh, controversies over chemical weapons, let's say. On the one hand, uh, you see in the, in the Australian, in the uh, News Limited, talking about, well, you know, Assad, this about chemical weapons as jihadists of Ben Brown. In fact, I believe everyone would have admitted that a few weeks ago they were losing ground, and therefore the, the Syrian airstrike and the geopolitics of it, what it meant for Russia and so on. In the middle of that, we've got independent, generally independent witnesses like the Pentagon consultant, uh, Ted Postol, talking about the details of the allegation. So we'll have time to explore those sorts of things. That's the agenda for today. Um, there are some pamphlets which I'll put down the front there if you haven't got the whole program. It was up on the screen before. Um, the Basically, three sessions today. This morning session, the afternoon session, and the evening session in the room next door there. So without further ado, I'll call on our first speaker, Mr. Jay Therapel, who's a PhD student at this university, and he's going to talk about Syria and the, collu the collusion, the confusion of the Western world. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is an amazing attendance for a, for a 9.30 start, I must say. Um, firstly, oh, yeah, So, when the Syrian war began, uh, large sections of the organized Western left and anti-war movement, uh, they began voicing their support for the overthrow of the Syrian government in a process that they called the Syrian Revolution. Now, not everyone on the left agreed with their position, uh, and, and soon enough, this faction were being labeled the Imperial Left. Um, by those of us who responded to the conflict by supporting the defense of the Syrian government. So why do we call them the imperial left? One, the forces waging war on the Syrian government are dominated by militias that advocate at least some degree of <coughs> genocide against religious minorities, especially the Shia, and by extension um, offshoots like the Alawites in Syria who constitute about 10% of the population. And they also threaten the secular freedom that secular freedoms that women enjoy in government-held Syria. Um, in other words, if these forces were to take power, it would not represent a progression. It wouldn't represent progress at all. It would represent um, a regression. It would represent, um, you know, uh, turning back the pages of history to something significantly worse. Um, secondly, <clears throat> these militias are infinitely more dependent on an external alliance of predatory nations for constant flows of foreign mercenaries, funding, weapons, training, and even direct assistance on the battlefield than they are on any internal discontent with the Syrian government. Indeed, if you look at the, 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 the sources of the insurgency, if you look at their own sources, like the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is fervently anti-government, you can see that they sport the, um, the three-starred flag that's used by the, the FSA insurgency. They say that anywhere between 49 to 71% of the dead among the insurgency are foreigners, as opposed to 5% on the side of the government. If you accept these premises as being true, then it makes more sense to characterize this war as an act of imperialist aggression against Syria, to therefore oppose the external destabilization, and by extension to support the defense of the Syrian government. The question then becomes, why did the imperial left get it so wrong? And so the purpose of this talk is to go over how Western societies in general deal with a country like Syria, how they relate to a country like Syria. I ask this because it seems the general population of this country seem to have a more cynical and therefore realistic view of what Trump is trying to do in, in Syria, um, especially when you compare them to, to the Western left. Um, or to ask a more objective question, what compels the imperial left to support this war against the Syrian government? And for me, it boils down to the nature of the conflict. So opposing the invasion of Iraq was a relatively easy matter because there was no ambiguity over who started it. However, in the case of Syria, the aggression has been hidden. It's been covert and it's been carried out by proxy. And more importantly, it's been carried out 
in the name of a popular revolution, which is extremely seductive for many Western leftists because it allows them the opportunity to vicariously experience something that feels like a revolution, but only in ways that uphold existing imperialist hierarchies. As a consequence of living in societies with a history of being the colonizers, the imperial left has no historical memory of resisting foreign imperialist aggression. And this is perfectly understandable in a country like Australia. Australia belongs to the Anglo-Imperial Axis, which is the United States, UK, Canada, and New Zealand, as well as our own country. These countries are not threatened by anyone, but they routinely threaten and attack other countries. So this is also why the imperial left, or large sections of the Western left in general, tend to view the world only in terms of class struggles between capitalists and workers. So when the Syrian revolution erupted, um, the imperial left automatically assumed that it was a popular working class rebellion against a capitalist government, while completely denying the possibility of it being an externally driven um, predatory war against an independent post-colonial nation. And so these are the two ways of looking at it. You know, on the, on the left-hand side, you've got the very simplistic way of saying, look, it's Assad regime versus the Syrian people. That's the Western media narrative. And then towards the right, you've got the, the perspective that I tend to sympathize with, with a lot more. Um, let's see. Okay. Western societies are particularly susceptible to war propaganda because their historic relationship with the post-colonial world encourage them to see these distant lands as being comprised of two types of people. Tyrants that need to be defeated and victims that need to be saved. So this is part of the colonial saviour complex, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. This is how the consent, uh, consent of the Western public was manufactured for supporting the war against Libya, um, with the role of the tyrant being played by the late, uh, late Colonel Muammar Gaddafi and the role of the victim being played by the Libyan people, quote-unquote the Libyan people. Instead of talking about what the so-called Libyan revolution was positively for, the focus was almost exclusively on demonizing the Libyan Jamaharia government for refusing to surrender the reins of power to an insurgency without a fight. What followed, and this is the real tragedy, you may have heard about this recently, was a long process of genocide for the black Libyan population, who today are being sold into slavery by warlords, who have turned one of Africa's most prosperous nations into a lawless wasteland headed in the same direction as Somalia. Many people in the West find it difficult to come to terms with the reality that in the Libyan situation, the real tyrant wasn't Gaddafi, it was their own governments. And the Libyan people paid the price for the Western left's failure to mobilize in their defense. So the imperial left in this context appears to be perfectly comfortable with that same scenario repeating itself in Syria, it, it, it appears like they've learned no lessons whatsoever. I'm certainly not comfortable with that scenario, and it appears that large sections of the Australian public these days seem to agree. This saviour complex has convinced many Western leftists that their role is to gaze condescendingly upon the region and to issue moralist denunciations of human rights violations without ever bothering to engage with the active political substance of the conflict at hand. The active political substance. And without ever bothering to engage with questions about what kind of a society the various warring parties are fighting for. So let's ask that as a question. What kind of societies are the two sides fighting for? And here we have to be very honest. On the one side you have an insurgency that is completely dominated by the forces of what you can call Tafiri extremism or Sunni chauvinist reaction, if you like, who call for the subjugation of religious minorities, particularly the Alawites who are promised an actual violent genocide if the state collapses, and the Druze as well. And the Christians are promised ethnic cleansing, but not to the same degree because they're people of the book. Whereas according to the, 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 the Salafi um, uh, scholar Ibn Taymiyyah, you know, the, the, the Shia are more disbelieving than the Christians and the Jews. Something I know frustrates a lot of uh, Syrian women in particular is how little Western feminists seem to care about the fact that these forces, with Western backing, have completely subjugated li uh, women living under their control, um, forcing them to don the niqab and to um, and thereby throwing away, like forcing them to to um, to do away with a lot of the social freedoms that they had when the Assad regime was in control. 
And then on the other hand, you have the Assad regime, which is the propaganda term for the Syrian government. It's used all the time. And sometimes when we use the term Syrian government, they say that we're the ones engaging in propaganda, right? Um, because the Syrian government has been relentlessly demonized, the counter-hegemonic narrative is constantly forced into a defensive mindset so that the pro-government perspective is rarely given a chance to tell its story. So what does the Syrian government under President Assad represent? In Syria, citizens are, are encouraged to take pride in their religious diversity. School children are taught from a very young age not to assert their religious differences. The celebration of, Christians, uh, of Christmas by Muslims and Eid by Christians is considered perfectly normal. Asking about someone's sect is considered rude, and the Grand Mufti of Syria, Sheikh Badruddin Hassan, who I had the privilege of meeting along with Tim and, and the rest of our delegation, um, commands the love and respect of all Syrians and is known throughout the region as a symbol of spiritual and interfaith unity. So prior to this conflict, Syria was actually a post-colonial success story. This is something that's never mentioned. If I read like an Indian journal about, about Syria, then they definitely do talk about that because they see Syria as a, as a fellow post-colonial nation that's managed to achieve a lot with the low income that it has. Um, and this is a feat that's largely been achieved by decades of, of, of free healthcare, free education, a strong public sector. And this is something that I covered in an article that I wrote last year for Al Mazdar News. I wrote that in the year prior uh, to the war, in, in the year, a year prior to the war, that is in 2010, Countries that were wealthier than Syria did only marginally better in terms of life expectancy on average, while countries with lower life expectancies than Syria did so on much higher incomes on average. So when it comes to their own election cycles, okay, Westerners, um, people in the West uh, find that it comes naturally for them to take sides, either because they think one party is more progressive or they think that the other side is, is, is the lesser evil. It's astonishing, therefore, that they can't approach Syria in a similar way, especially when the consequences of the state collapsing are infinitely more worrying, especially for religious minorities and especially for women, and especially for, for members of the LGBT community. You see the way Islamic State treats, treats um, uh, gays and lesbians in Syria. So just two days ago in Syria, bombs targeted civilians who were being evacuated from the besieged government-held towns of Kefraya and Fua killing at least 92 civilians, including 49 children. The government was able to secure the release, secure their evacuation, but only after escorting militants by bus from the insurgent-held towns of Zabadani and Madaya. They made it to Idlib safely. Ahrar al-Sham, which, like, which is one of the moderate rebel groups, um, uh, one of the moderate rebel groups responsible for ex uh, es escorting the evacuation, They've denied responsibility, but all the circumstances point to them being responsible, especially given that the last time the government sent buses to those two towns back in December 2016, they were attacked and burned. In fact, one of the militiamen who filmed this incident had this to say. He said, you want to evacuate the Shia? They're only going to leave in corpses. And that's a sign of who was, who was responsible for that attack. Most likely it was them. These are the forces that are backed by the West. So when it comes, so when they commit heinous uh, atrocities, the media is silent, and there's no international condemnation, either from our government or from Western general, Western governments in general. However, when these same forces accuse the Syrian government of using chemical weapons, not only are they taken at their word, but in the latest instance, uh, it's used as a pretext to cripple the Syrian state with airstrikes before any independent investigation has been conducted. The next issue I want to talk about is the, is the kind of weird nexus between Islamophobia and imperialism. So, one of the biggest ironies of the Syrian war is how Western foreign policy conflicts with their own internal propaganda narratives. On the one hand, Muslims are demonized in the West. Um, in fact, in, in a poll last year, it was revealed that 49% of Australians wanted to ban Muslim immigration. Um, on the other hand, in Syria, Western foreign policy is quite openly collaborating with Al-Qaeda. Um, and the media never really bothers to make that connection. So if you're, if you're from the press, I'd encourage you to definitely make that connection. The confusion for the Western left is that their consciously stated rejection of Western propaganda, in the Syrian instance, has been mobilized towards unknowingly serving imperial interests. So for example, their rejection 
of Islamophobia has made it easier for them to sympathise with the Islamists fighting the Syrian government, who ironically have been covertly supported by the same Western governments that nurtured and promoted Islamophobia in the first place, especially after 9-11. The Islamophobia that has dominated the West ever since 9-11 is premised on a fundamental lie, which is that the Muslim world created quote-unquote Islamic extremism as a weapon against the West, when in fact history is the other way around. The West created Islamic extremism as a weapon against Muslim-majority countries with secular governments. What happened in Afghanistan? The CIA and Saudi Arabia created and funded Al-Qaeda so they could build a global network which they could use to funnel fighters from all over the world into Afghanistan to fight against the Afghan government in order to topple one of the most progressive governments in Afghanistan's history, a government that was defended by the Soviet Union. In 1988, under President Dr. Muhammad Najibullah's government, 15,000 women served in Afghanistan's national army, and women were 40% of all doctors, as well as 60% of all teachers at Kabul University. However, by the late 1990s, Afghan women were being filmed dragged, kicking and screaming into football stadiums, uh, you know, to be shot in the head or stoned to death for adultery. The imperial left fully supported that jihad against, so-called jihad against Afghanistan, and it appears they're perfectly comfortable with that same scenario repeating itself in Syria. So, I mean, today we can't even talk about, like, Islamic extremism as one thing, because it's a bit too misleading. Really, now what we've seen is the rise of Sunni chauvinism. Right? Which isn't to have a go at Sunnis, it's just to say that within their current, because they have a history of being the, the, the sect that's, in, that's been in power, the sect that, that represents state power throughout Islamic history except for the 10th century when the Fatimids were in control, um, there is a chauvinism that, that emanates um, uh, from the ideologues of, of, of the Sunni world. So, but, but the question is, how do we engage with that? So, you know, after the... here we go. After the invasion of Iraq in 2003, the big mistake that the Western left made was to assume that the terrorist actions and, and hateful ideology of Al-Qaeda was simply an equal but opposite uh, knee-jerk response to the US occupation. So here's an example from the International Socialism Journal. They say the goals of Al-Qaeda are no different from other national liberation movements, right? Um, and this is, this is complete nonsense. Uh, the function of Al-Qaeda in Iraq was to punish and destabilize Iraq for, for electing pro-Iranian political parties in the 2005 elections. The big fear that Saudi Arabia, Israel and the United States had was that Iran, Iraq, Syria and Lebanon would form an independent bloc that threatened their interests in the region. So throughout the occupation, Al-Qaeda would routinely target Shia civilians with bombing campaigns that killed thousands of people and Western leftists would simply claim that this was a straightforward response to victimization. Instead of doing their homework to determine Al-Qaeda's actual function, many leftists simply assumed that they were victims, just like the victims of Islamophobia in their own societies. So when the Syrian war began, uh, they swallowed the narrative of victimhood with far greater enthusiasm, because they were being encouraged by the Western media to do so. In the Western, media, in the Western portrayal of Syria, the explicit genocidal actions and intentions of the insurgency are officially condemned but then portrayed as simply an opposite but equal Newtonian response to state oppression. This is done by presenting the insurgency's version of the us versus them narrative as the official, objective and unbiased account of how much support each side has. The imperial left perspective is itself premised on accepting that narrative, um, accepting in particular the narrative that uh, the genocidal, shia-phobic, sectarian, the, the narrative that all genocidal, shia-phobic, sectarians cling to as their justification for waging war against the Syrian state, which is that the Alawite minority uses the state to somehow oppress the Sunni majority. It never occurs to them that this is the same narrative that's being promoted by Islamic State and Al-Qaeda as well. If one were to say that Jews control the US government, for example, I'm sure many people, including the Western left, would collectively denounce such a comment as being anti-Semitic, and they would have good reasons for, for, for saying that. But when similar claims are being used to demonize um, minorities in post-colonial countries, particularly the Alawite population in Syria, who are being told by revolutionaries that they will be exterminated if the state is overthrown, um, the imperial left appears to have no problems in joining in the demonization campaign. 
So to conclude, the current battle over what becomes the dominant history of the Syrian war is being fought between two extremes. On the one extreme, only internal factors of the war are addressed. So this goes back to my previous slide. You know. um, and that is that there's an oppressive government. And this is the approach taken by the media networks of the countries that wish to topple the Syrian government. On the other extreme, only the external factors of the war are addressed. So this is, for example, the narrative when we talk about the dirty war on Syria. We don't deny that there are internal factors, but we just emphasize the external factor. And the question is why? Given the ag agenda-driven nature of international relations, the countries that contribute to the external factors of the war tend to promote a discourse that focuses on the internal factors of, of the country at war. The problem with this is that it conveys to the citizens of those countries, including Western societies like ours, that they cannot influence the outcome of these wars despite the actions of our own governments, Western governments that is, in fueling these conflicts to begin with. So to fix this, the discourse in external countries should focus on external factors since it would be more empowering for the public to focus on the factors that they can actually influence. This is an important principle. People who live in predatory nations that are destabilizing Syria are encouraged to think about ways in which they can save the Syrians from their own government while being kept in the dark about, about um, the suffering that their own government's policies are causing. <coughs> So, for example, how many people know that Australia participates in the economic sanctions on Syria? Raise, raise your hands if you know about that. Actually, that's not too bad. But then again, you're, you're an educated audience. You don't necessarily reflect public opinion. Right? These sanctions are killing Syrians quietly, either through artificially inflated food prices and, medi and medicine shortages, or by preventing them from receiving remittances from abroad. Lifting these sanctions is one of the easiest ways to make life easier for ordinary Syrians, but it would require people in the West to come to terms with the reality that their governments are the problem, or, or at least are a part of the problem, not the solution. The confusion about world events, especially among the left, can be remedied, but it would require moving away from those narratives about these wars that focus solely on issuing moralist denunciations of select groups of individuals like President Assad and instead by moving towards addressing the external causal explanations involving the major world powers. Thank you very much.